Take a trip with us to New Bob. Just promise not to drink the goo. Oh my God. If you get sucked into the Matrix, Matrix. we will send a phone for you. Do you believe in fate? But every movie has a plot hole. Just like uh, your opinion, man. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Plotaholics podcast. I'm Shane Wilson, and I'm a Plotaholic. Hi, Shane. Hi. <laughs> and I'm Brian, and I'm a Plotaholic. Hi, Brian. Hello. Brian, let me ask you a quick question. How many days sober are you? I am Goose Egg days sober shane uh yeah ditto actually and uh and that's because you know uh i don't know if you got a whiff of it today but there was uh there were people throwing burgers out on the grill and i'm sniffing i'm trying to smell it you could sort of hear the crack of a beer can opening yeah it's great and you know it they can really only mean one thing, and that is that it is Will Smith Timber. Will Smith Timber. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Do the parents understand that it's Will Smith Timber? Hmm. Oh, they just don't understand. Oh, and I guess the girls of the world are nothing but trouble either during Smith Timber. Smith Timber, there are there are a few things that you can do in Smith Timber. One of them is obviously you can get jiggy with it. Na 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 na. <laughs> um, and another one is that you can punch aliens right in the face. And you know what? That is the perfect segue to this week's episode of the Plotaholics. The Plotaholics present. Actually, no, no, no. Let, let's take it to. Um, let's take it old school. Submitted for your approval. Independence <laughs> Day. Yeah. <laughs> and Independence Day. Uh, is a film that I have very fond memories of from childhood, and I haven't watched in a lot. number of I haven't watched in a number of years uh, until just this week when we were getting ready to do this. And I was worried, Brian, that that it wouldn't hold up for me. You know, I, I watch it. I'm a little bit different from you. I, I like to watch cert, some Will Smith movies, you know, once every you know year or so, depending yeah. on what it is. Like, I haven't watched Hancock since January, and the last time I watched um, Independence Day before watching it for the show was probably around Christmas. Actually, I watch Independence Day around Christmas every year because mm-hmm. when it first came out during, you know, the summer of, I believe it's 1995, 95 or 96. 96. 1996, thank you. It came out on home video for the Christmas season. And I got it for Christmas. So that was when I got my first VCR. And a tradition for my was born. Absolutely, sir. And a good tradition, I would think. You know, some of my best memories uh, from childhood, even outside of watching Independence Day a whole lot on VHS, was uh, the holiday season movies. I remember Thanksgiving week. It was tradition like the night of thanksgiving uh network television always showed et every year mm. uh and i remember sitting around with the old grandparents there and, and watching some et i remember when um this is a really weird memory to have but i remember being a little kid and in et they make a comment about how like you know in 24 hours or whatever you know uh something is going to happen And I don't remember exactly what it was, but I looked at my dad and I was like, do we have to watch this for 24 hours? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's funny. Even to this day, I think on TNT during Christmas, they show a Christmas story for 24 hours straight. Yeah. So, you know, I I have fond memories of 
watching that stuff. And, you know, if there's something that can be said for if there's something that we've lost in the streaming age, it's the accidental find. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and just like clicking through the channels and then just absolutely ab accidentally finding E.T. or Independence Day or whatever on TV and deciding that, you know what, I wasn't looking for this, but I'm going to give it a shot. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the one thing I miss, because in the age of streaming, you, you pretty much pick and choose whatever you want. And, you know, if there's nothing, quote unquote, on, then you just go to the old standby. For me, that's The Office or Parks and Rec or something. Absolutely. And what's crazy is that with streaming, you know, you go through, you see something in the case of Hulu or even Netflix, you put it in your queue or whatever, but then you never get to it because like you said, you go to your, your go-tos yeah. way more often than not. And then who has time to like sit and discover things, you know, S especially for us where we're doing this for, you know, hope, you know, on the early stages of doing this for a living, we don't really have time to like search, seek and destroy. Yeah, and the other thing is, is because of the way that streaming platforms have sort of taken off, and uh, it, it just feels like it's an unwinnable war to to try to watch everything. Absolutely, and it makes you feel really, really bad for the independent stuff because you're not going to get as much attention as the mainstream stuff, at least with some indie things. You know, even if you were put on late night on HBO, Cinemax, the movie channel, Showtime, yeah. you know, someone was going to catch you. And then yeah. that's how you got a following. That's how I discovered the movie Black Circle Boys. Right. Yeah. A movie that uh, should be on the short list for us in the next year. Um, oh, absolutely. If you haven't seen it, you, you, you're going to love it. It's, I can't wait. And it's one of Donnie Wahlberg's first films, too. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. Uh, it's one that has made its way into our theme song. So yes, it um, has. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we've got to get into that. Uh, so let's see, Independence Day. Yeah, let's was... let's, di let's dissect this flick. This was this was Will Smith's um one of his earlier films because he had been doing Fresh Prince of Bel Air, then he did um Six Degrees of Separation, and then we came upon actually what else did he do before? He also did Made in America with Ted Danson and um Whoopi Goldberg in a guest in a guest starring role. Yeah, and um also a a few albums thrown in there for good measure too. Oh, absolutely. Well, so because, yeah, so he has he has four credits uh four film credits before Independence Day. Bad Boys which we're doing in uh Next week, actually. No, next week is Men in Black, and then it's Oh, Bad right, Boys. right. So in two weeks, we're doing Bad Boys. Yeah, he did um, Where Does the Day Take You in 92, which I haven't even heard of. I have to try to find that. Uh, Made in America, where he played um, Nia Long's best friend. Mm -hmm. Six Degrees of Separation, where he played Con Man Paul, which if you haven't seen Six Degrees of Separation... That's a brilliant movie. And I think this is the movie that really showed that Will Smith could act because yeah. he held his own with the likes of Anthony Michael Hall, um, um, Stocker Channing, and um, Donald Sutherland. Yeah, and then in 95, when Bad Boys comes out, he really like solidifies himself as leading man material. Oh, he stole that. He stole, that was supposed to be a Martin Lawrence thing. He robbed Martin Lawrence like a thief in the night. Yeah, and he, I mean, he's a scene stealer in anything that he's in. Absolutely. But he gets on a run in 95, Bad Boys, Independence Day, Men in Black, Enemy of the State, which is one of my favorite Will Smith in a, movies. In a very unsung film. It's very, and once again, he holds his own with Gene Hackman. Yeah, that's a great movie. And then Wild Wild West happened. And that's a little stumble. But then, I mean, look, two years later, he's got Ali, which is like still critically acclaimed in a lot Absolutely. of. The Legend of Bagger Vance was a very was an yeah. under underrated film. And yep. then you had Men in Black 2, Bad Boys 2. Right, then he gets into, like, sequelitis for a little while. But then um, he, he does that cameo in Jersey Girl, which is my favorite Kevin Smith movie. One of my yeah. favorite Kevin Smith movies. And then I, Robot, which is a great movie. But And, I mean, we can go on and on with, like, some of the, the, the home runs he's hit. Yeah, he has a, a pretty wild uh, filmography. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a he's lot of had, stuff He's done a little of everything. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff here that you, you know, so at one point in my life, Brian, 
every time I heard a Foo Fighters song on the radio, I would be like, oh, I really like that song. But I don't think, but I don't know that I really like the Foo Fighters, you know? Right. And then I heard all like a lot of their songs in a row one time and i was like oh my god i actually really like the foo fighters <laughs> uh, isn't it funny how that happens <laughs> yeah and this will smith is the same if you think about will smith you're gonna think of like three or four movies right off the top that he's been in but then when you start really digging into it you're like oh man this dude has done the full gambit like even something like hitch which is not a perfect movie is still fun and still made you know decent it is life. a fun it's a fun flick and he it's another it's another example of him just sort of running things. Yeah, and we I, I asked I think on our live show we asked the question ha, has he ever had a run of bad movies and he really hasn't because not really no the closest that he comes and so like I was thinking like After Earth and Bright are two movies that have come out in the last few handful of years that were not w- well received but but Bright even, was fun. Right, but even between the and Suicide Squad is another one, but I don't know that you can blame him, uh, you know, blame that nah, on him. Nah, he he did the best he could with what he had. But even but, buried in there, you've still got concussion, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's it's hard to find things that he's done that are just terrible because even, he hasn't done anything. Right, and even the worst stuff that he does is made better by him being in it. Like he's a great performer. He really is, and a lot of the things that he has done. Like if he's not in that movie, it fails. Yeah. Oh, it, for sure. It just absolutely fails. And this is a movie too, Independence Day. I'm talking about now, where you know we already said it. This is only his fourth movie. Yeah. And he's thrown into an ensemble cast of who's freaking who. This cast is wild. It really is. Now I'm trying to bring up something to make my point. Just bear with me for a second. Do you need the cast list? Because I can read some names oh, that year. Oh no, I've got the cast list. I'm looking for someone in particular. And his character is so obscure because he only gets screen time for like five seconds in the very beginning. But he's still a great actor. Now, just to give you a quick who's who. This is a movie that has a who's who of people whose names you know and faces that you've seen, but names that you don't know. Right. Now, I'm actually going to start with this guy because as soon as I find his name, because once again, he's a gr- wow, he's a great actor. Um, Eric Avari, mm-hmm. who he plays the uh, the head scientist in the very beginning of the movie right. when he was R. Yeah. yeah. And he comes out and he trips over the golf balls. Now, Eric Avari, you may not know the name, but he was in Stargate. Yeah, you definitely know that face. Yeah, you know his face. He was in Stargate. He was in The Mummy. He played Electra's – he played Electra Jennifer Gardner's father in the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie. This guy has been in some good movies. And also Daredevil. Yeah, well, that's what I was just saying. He played. <laughs> right. Yeah, he was in Daredevil. Well, no, he was. He's been. And in good he movies. was. He was Daredevil, and he was in good movies. Right there, you go. That's what I was saying. I mean, come on, Mr. Deeds. Um, well, Flight of the Living Dead. I mean, well, we can ignore that. Paul Blart. I guess this guy has been in movies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's been yes. in movies. This but, guy has been in movies. Yeah, he has done things, but I mean, Bill Pullman. Jeff Goldblum. I'm actually going down the cast list. Yeah. Bill Pullman, Jeff Goldblum, Mary McDonald, Judd Hirsch, Robert Loja. Yeah. R, as in, are you Robert Loja? Sorry. Every time I hear his name, I have to. Randy Quaid, Margaret Collin, who she's not the biggest name on this list, but still. Um, James Rebhorn, who is, he plays that slimy ass guy in every movie he's in and he does it amazingly this time around as um secretary of defense um Nimziki, who you you like that whole movie i was praying he would die <laughs> yeah <laughs> it really just gets fired yeah which is, which is fine just as, well when you get fired during the apocalypse you know your life is over yeah you've done a bad job um, but moving down the list. Like, right, because if you get fired during the apocalypse, it's not like we have somebody else in mind to take your place. <laughs> just You're just fired, and we're better off without you. Who needs yeah. you? Um, Harvey Firestein, who is an amazing actor. He did 
some great he's got that voice that you just know his voice when you hear it yeah and um adam baldwin who is an under appreciated actor but he's been in firefly he's been in um He's been in a lot of stuff. He was in the final season of Angel. His first film was one of Matt Dillon's first films as well, My Bodyguard. Brett Spiner himself, Data. I mean, come on, dude. Even Frank the Bunny is in this movie. <laughs> okay. Um, you, I might have been, the, the cat was making noise. I might have missed it. But you did mention the Randy Quaid, right? Who oh, I did mention the is Randy also a huge scene stealer in in any moment of this movie that he's in. Oh, he is so lovable. I don't think anyone has loved a drunk as much as we love Randy Quaid. Yeah. Oh, I picked what a day to quit drinking. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously. Oh man. Where, you know what? It's like his kids hate him. No one likes him, but we love him. Yeah. And, and he has a really great redemption story and that's something that we can get to in a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, yeah, go ahead. I didn't mean even, to interrupt. Even the dad from the Wonder Years is in this movie, man. Okay. I thought that was him. Dan Loria. Yes, he is. Robert Loja even gives him a look of shade because he he tried to go through the door first. Yeah. <laughs> oh right. man. I mean, everyone is in this movie. I think I think Sharon might be even in this movie. She might have had a cameo. <laughs> Um, did yeah. you have a cameo in um, Independence Day? You were old enough back then. You were in your 20s. You were ready. You were there. She was in it. She she was an extra in the New York scenes. Right. There you go. She's the, <laughs> one of the women that like gets out of the car and looks up astonished at the Empire State Building. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, she she's one of the ones. I think she's the chick that gets hit by the taxi. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so when you when you start reading this cast list, it feels, especially with that many A-listers, and even in 1996, A-listers, right? Absolutely. Goldblum, Pullman, Smith, uh, Quaid, Vivica Fox, like these people could have carried, are, like they can open movies by themselves, you know? Absolutely. It was and, it, well, a lot of people didn't even, a lot of people were even asking, what's the Fresh Prince doing in this? Yeah, right. And he got ripped up for this role. I mean, he got ripped up, I guess, for bad boys actually. But, uh, but oh, man. when you he look at that too, when you, yeah, for sure. When you get this many a listers though, I think the tendency is to think, how are we going to, how are we going to give them all equal time and not even equal time, but how are we going to give all these, how is this movie going to justify having this many big names in it? You know, because you're creating an ensemble film, and ensemble films don't usually aren't usually made up of A-listers. Absolutely. And and the crazy thing is, it's that everyone brings their best. Yeah. And and it's like there's no ego to this movie, and it's and it, and it's like nothing. Nobody. I want to say no one overshadows e- anyone because the scene stealers steal the scenes, but even as they're stealing the scene, your everyday folks aren't having their thunder stolen. A, a, a place for everything and everything in its place or everyone in their place, you know? Yeah, and I want to get into that, and I think it's done really well in uh, the first act. But before we get uh, into that, I want to, for the uninitiated, uh, a quick synopsis. And if you haven't seen this movie, number one, but if you haven't seen this movie, shame on you. Shame. Bing, bing. Shame. Ding, ding. Shame. <laughs> you must walk naked down a cobblestone street in the middle of summer. No. Agreed. I'm I'm there <laughs> for that. Um, on July 2nd, 1996, an enormous mothership UFO that has one-fourth the mass of the moon enters orbit around Earth, deploying assault fortress saucers each 15 miles wide that take positions over some of Earth's major cities. David Levinson, an MIT-trained satellite technician, decodes a signal embedded within global satellite transmissions that he determines is the alien's countdown timer for a coordinated attack. With help from his former wife, White House Communications Director Constance Spano, 
David and his father Julius gain access to the Oval Office and warn President Thomas J. Whitmore the aliens are hostile. Whitmore immediately orders large-scale evacuations of New York and other major cities, but it is too late. The timer reaches zero and the saucers activate devastating directed energy weapons, killing millions. Whitmore, the Levinsons, and a few others narrowly escape aboard Air Force One as the capital is destroyed along with the other locations over which the saucers are positioned. From there, we des- they decide that Essentially, the aliens are harvesting these planets, and uh, they are here to exterminate, essentially, mankind. Exterminate. Exterminate. It's like they're the dialects. (laughs) Right. Uh, The movie was made on a $75 million budget and made $817.4 million in 1996. Woo! In today money, that would be well over a billion. Yeah, pretty much. It, it, in today's money, you could probably buy Greenland up under the president. It was the highest <laughs> grossing film of 1996 and Damn the second right. highest grossing film ever at the time behind only Jurassic Park. Well, I'll uh, tell you something right now. This is probably for me, this is like one of the mo- one of the quintessential films of the 90s, period. I agree with that. Yeah, and again, I said at the top, I was worried to revisit this film after so long because special effects and things have come so far. And I have, it it has such a nostalgic place in me uh, in my childhood, but when I watched it, man, it, it holds up so well. Okay. It really does. The, the special effects are very practical. They look really good. And now I was watching on my laptop on Hulu yeah, but I have it on Blu-ray, and when I put it on my my you know my smart TV, it looks absolutely amazing. It holds yeah. up so well, and a lot of the special effects and the the CG, and even I don't even think they really did a lot of CGI. It looks better than most movies today that are made. Yeah, there's a lot of sort of Star Wars era uh, special effects here. You know, a lot of blue screen and things like that. Um, and like you said, a lot of practical effects. The aliens that we see in the film were actually made, and the people, and they were costumes or whatever. And so the people were actually interacting with these things on screen and on set instead of having to go in and digitally insert them later. And I think that that is a huge deal. When anytime, I think anytime you can use a practical effect instead of a instead of CGI, you're probably better served to do that. I agree 100%. Because um, practical effects just translate better. And when they're done right, they really do stand the test of time. You look at the film, um, John Carpenter's Vampires, Mm -hmm. and some of those practical effects still look amazing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them. I mean, just look at A New Hope at the most Isley Cantina scene. Absolutely. Like, makeup effects are really where it's at, and the unsung heroes of the film industry. I agree. Um, There's there's really no – there's no denying that at all. Yeah, this one's for you, makeup artist. Real American heroes. <laughs> this is for um, you, makeup artist. Putting yeah. makeup on a man's face. <laughs> <laughs> I love those commercials. Those Me were so too. good. Those were the, like, I swear, man, that marketing campaign was like the absolute best. I wish they never would have quit those. Yeah, this one goes out to you, foam finger guy. <laughs> Oh, you've got the finger in the air. <laughs> it was too good, man. It was too good. You had like the hair band guy like in the recording booth just letting it <laughs> letting it go, man. <laughs> you know what? I picture you remember the movie um um the 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 stepdad movie with um Mark Wahlberg and um and uh, Will Ferrell. Yeah, Daddy's home, <laughs> when, right? Yeah, Daddy's when he just walks into the booth and he does the jingle. That's what yeah. I'm picturing. <laughs> Dusty is singing in the booth. Wow, yeah. oh, I look like Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, so anyway. I want to <laughs> start here, um, and and I want to try to take it a little bit of a different perspective here. All right. Um, I don't want to do as, as much, quite as much summary because. You know, we're supposed to be analyzing these things, yeah, right? We're analyzing. So, we, yeah. We so of need, course there's. Go through the movie. Yeah, so of course there's going to be some summary, but I don't know that we need to go through beat by beat. 
uh, as, as we've been doing. So what I'd like to do first is look at the first act of this film. And by my measurement, the first act runs from the opening titles through the moment that the dog jumps into the closet. Well, well and they do, they do that for us. January 2nd is act yep. one. Yeah. January, I mean, June, January, July 2nd <laughs> is act one. Yeah. July 3rd is act two. Yep. July 4th is act three. Absolutely. And who cares about the yeah, nobody, because you know we're we we've beat them at that point, and now what's left to do but pick up all the pieces. You know, talk about a real Debbie Downer of a movie. Like, <laughs> what if it? What if they? What if the sequel was the day after Independence Day, and it was just about Reconstruction? Oh, that would be so boring. <laughs> <laughs> and what's really bad is that Adrian Toomes is trying to get everything together, and Tony said, "Oh wait, did I cross genres? <laughs> Whoops." <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so that first act is masterful pacing. It uh, really is. It introduces every character, and it doesn't spend too much. It spends just the right amount of time. And that's the thing, is that it would be so easy for uh, a movie with this many different people in that many different locations. Because at the top of the film, you have uh, Will Smith and uh we don't a. See him until 20 minutes in right yeah as as one of the leads we don't see him until way into the first act um but he is uh living in is he in he's in new york right no he's, he's in, in dc L no he's in la he's in la yeah he's he's staying with her you're right you're right he's staying with her because he's on leave because he's stationed at the el toro um right that, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's my bad. So Will Smith is in L.A., but then you have the, the president and his folks. They're in D.C., and then you have the folks in New York. Uh, and you have other people that are just kind of like in the desert and shit. And yeah, like you Randy have these, Wade and his kids and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so you just have these pockets of people, and the first act does a good job of introducing you to all of them enough that you care about their characters, but without bogging it down, you know? Absolutely. And, but it, and it also sets up our antagonists as well, very slowly. Yeah. And that's something that I appreciated about this movie when I saw it before and something that I have newfound respect for this time is how slowly they how well they pace that reveal of those ships coming through the atmosphere. Absolutely. It has a real sort of. Uh, what's the word I'm looking it's for? It's old like, school sci-fi, man. Like, yeah, like I was Encounters just of the say, Third Kind. I was just going to say that. Yeah, it's like Encounters of the Third Kind, The Day After Tomorrow. That Even um, War of the Worlds kind of a setup. Yeah, yeah, where like the threat is looming, but you don't see it. Even signs, right? Like the threat right. is there, but you don't see it for so long. And that tension and the patience that the filmmakers had in that in those first 30 to 40 minutes is just not something that we see a lot anymore you're right and the, well the great thing is too this is one of the and i'm probably going to be wrong when i make this observation but this is also one of the first like alien attacking movies where the people at first weren't afraid i mean people are on building tops under these under these ships at you know at toward the end of the first act and they're yeah. partying and oh they're gonna bring back Elvis and they got signs like it's a WWF event or something. Right. This was what was really great about the world that they built here. Um, we have we've complained in a lot of other films that we've done, especially things like Masters of the Universe, <laughs> where like a lot of the action takes place in a city. But then the only people in that city are the main characters. Like it's right. like it's like <laughs> if you if you had Independence Day set in New York, but there were only seven people there. Yeah, it's like fake ass New York City. <laughs> That's almost like Deadpool making the observation. It's funny this whole mansion here, and I only ever see the two of you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. And so they do a really good job with casting extras. They make the they make every one of these cities feel like it's full. Exactly. Each city. And not only full, but full of different kinds of people, full of, of people that are afraid, that are trying to get out, people that are just like in awe, people that are partying it up, you know? Right. And that's the way it would be if if this really happened, there would be people there to greet them on the tops of these buildings with signs like that. Meanwhile, my black ass would be going to Redneckville, Pennsylvania so quick. I would uh, seriously be going to like, I would be going into like central Pennsylvania 
where the clan is like doing cross burning classes. Yeah. I would be going there because I'd rather deal with the rednecks than the laser beams. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to believe that if you went somewhere like even like, fuck, like Indiana or something, like it'd be a long time before they bothered with Indiana, you know? They probably didn't even touch Indiana. <laughs> no, I mean, not at first. I mean, they're probably going to eventually if we don't stop them. But they, but after they very, two days, they're not touching Indiana. No, but they're clearly like hitting major population centers. Yeah, you figure New York. Uh, th- th- this is where I'm thinking they're hitting. They obviously hit New York, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles first. Right. And then they ended up hitting like Houston because yeah, and this part, is just in the United States because they also were sightings all over the world. You know, right. they there were and it was very strategic. As yeah, they there, said. It was, there were title cards for locations in Iraq. Um, Russia. They were, yep, exactly. So the and that was another thing that I really liked about the way that the invasion was set up was that they uh, they sort of thought like the filmmakers thought like a strategist would think, right. If they you hit had all the major places, if you had the manpower to do it, this is exactly how you would do it. Oh, yeah, because like if I were doing this, I would definitely have done exactly what they did. But and I don't know if they mentioned it or not, but I would have had one of those ships in Chicago, too. Yeah, I'm not sure that if they mentioned that or not, but nah, they did. Uh, <laughs> but they they would, you know, honestly, if you look at the maps that they show, like you could probably see whether or not it was there. Absolutely. Um, but and again, a, a, a strong attention to detail there. But yeah, really good pacing in the first act. You enter, you're introduced to all the characters, and you care about all of them. And I mentioned in our live show, or maybe just off the air sometime, that some show, some of these disaster films try to do the same thing where they establish an ensemble cast, and then they don't give me enough of the people, enough of the humanity of the characters for me to care when they die. Or right. even care that they're in danger, and I would I would say the day after tomorrow is is guilty of that kind of thing. When people started dying in the day after tomorrow, I was like, I don't even know which white person that is. Right. It so. was it was kind of like that too with um Armageddon. Yeah. When those when the meteors start hitting, oh wow, that Samoan guy that I saw for all of five seconds is dead. Oh well. Yeah. You know, I didn't even care I, about the dog. That's why I think that. In you know in the '90s we had this really interesting moment where he we had dueling disaster films almost every year. Yeah. Uh, and you would have you had um, Armageddon, but you also had Deep Impact. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I liked Deep Impact. Deep uh, Impact wasn't bad, but unfortunately it got so overshadowed. I think it was Armageddon's soundtrack that did it. That was a big and, part of it, but also the cast. Yeah, the cast did it too. But Deep you, Impact was a more subtle like. It was, a, it was a more it, subtle, more well done film. Right, and I would say the same goes for um, Dante's Peak versus Volcano. Volcano was such a fun movie, though. It was fun, but Dante's Peak felt like a more yeah. human film. Absolutely, but I think that um, Tommy Lee Jones and I know we're, we're we're so jumping all over the place. We're really not though, because I'm bringing it back. Right, you are bringing it back. You're bringing. I'm not even going to say it. I almost made a Clerks 2 reference that I had no business making. But Tommy Lee Jones, like Will Smith, whatever you put him in, it automatically makes it a better movie. Right. But what I was and, – and the, the point that I was coming to is that it is so hard for a film to both capture the fun aspect of a big blockbuster and the human aspect of a good movie, of a good film. Mm. But Independence Day finds a way to toe that line and, it, and give us – three-dimensional complex character human characters in the backdrop of like an alien invasion film absolutely it and it makes use of every single second of its two and a half hour runtime and the two and a half hours flies by because it it really does it just clicks along man and not only are the writers taking the alien invasion as like from a military strategy perspective they're also taking the human response in that same sort of like, you know, one upsmanship sort of thing. Like we're going to do this and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. And if none of that works, then we'll do this. And if, you know, absolutely. So it, and, and you I see totally, every little bit, every single yeah, bit of human behavior. I totally believe that most, uh, 
pragmatic leaders like Bill Pullman plays in this film would send up some kind of aircraft to try to communicate first. Right. And then if that didn't work, then you would attack with your basic military sort of, you know, missiles and firepower. And if that didn't work and you decided that they were here hell bent on destroying all of us, then you would try nukes. And if that didn't work, I appreciated that he pulled off because a lot of people there were just like, yo, like, let's nuke the fuckers. Like, let's keep going. Maybe the next one will work. And he was like, no, no, that's it. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. We tried it. It didn't work. Right. And he did not want to fire nukes even. And that was a great, I just, if the aliens are going to come to pull some shit, I just hope they do it in like three years, three to five years. So that way there's no chance that, uh, I'm not going to get political, but, but, but moving on. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, but I mean, the whole aspect of it is where Will Smith makes it work on the ground level, the physical level. Mm-hmm. Bill Pullman makes it work on the emotional level. And then you get Jeff Goldblum that makes it work on, you know, the intelligence, the, yeah, uh, the, the mental level, the mental level. So you have all three aspects and all three of these guys really fest foster, you know, the different aspects. You got the government aspect, you have the soldier aspect and you have the everyday person. Yeah. You have the offense, the defense and the special teams. Absolutely. And it just all comes together in a nice, beautiful bow of summer goodness. That's right. And it, man, I don't know. 20th Century Fox, man, really had a winner here. I'm serious. They they really did. And I'll tell you something right now. If Disney were to come up with a way to have a good bookend, like if they did decide to greenlight a sequel and actually did did better. Yeah. I mean, because look. I don't even like I, I, I'm ashamed that I even watched the sequel as much as I love this movie. I'm ashamed that I even watched the sequel. That's how bad it was. Now, I haven't seen the sequel. Don't um, don't. Yeah. Like, honestly, I'll put it to you like this. You remember how we felt about Troll 2? Yeah. That is the sequel, but with better special effects. Gotcha. And that almost makes it worse, right? Because yes. it should be better. <laughs> It really should because you had Roland Emmerich back again and it was still just a merp, merp, yeah. meep. But anywho, so in I want to talk film, sorry, a little yeah, bit ahead. about how uh, the film, I think one of the interesting things that this movie does is it uses the destruction at the end of act one to shuffle the deck of cards uh, and the deck of cards being the different characters at the, in the second act, all of our characters are working on getting together, but you have Will Smith hook up with Quaid's character. You have Vivica A. Fox hook up oh, with the first lady. Mary, McC- Mary McConnell's character, yep. Right, and so I like this. And then we get have... Goldblum hooking up. Well, Goldblum ends up hooking up with uh, Pullman. Right, and I like this because these are people that are from different stages of life, right? But also, right. in a lot of ways, binary opposites of each other. You right. have in the Goldblum Pullman uh, relationship there uh, between their characters. You have uh, Goldblum, and his character's name is Dan David David, da- Levinson. David Levinson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dave, you have David's wife who Constance, leaves him, who right. leaves him for her career, but he thought that she was cheating with Pullman. At right. One so point. you have these two people here who are clearly at odds with each other. Maybe maybe not from Pullman's side, but. Uh, Levinson has always thought that there was like a, a rivalry there, you know? Right. Well, cause he felt like his wife chose the president over him and her career over him. And you actually see that in an argument they have where she goes, didn't you ever want to be a part of something special? I was yeah. part of something special. Right. <laughs> then you <laughs> have, we, then you have the first lady get, uh, get hooked up with Vivica A. Fox's character who is, is Will Smith's girlfriend. Right. Who is, a stripper. stripper. Mm-hmm. And that's another interesting sort of dichotomy there between first great. lady, almost royalty. Right. With a commoner. Right. And, and someone then, who, who society looks down on because she takes off her clothes for money, which right. let's, let's be clear. There's nothing wrong with that. That, that, right. that it's, there's so many other things. And then you know what, with, with the, the way people are 
you know, why not make money? If you can make money doing, you know, why not? It, it's why nobody's not? business how yeah. you make your money. Absolutely. And then on the on the third prong there, you have Will Smith, a jet fighter pilot, hook up with a a a character. Marine, who is yeah. a bur- who's a burnout from the Vietnam War, who's actually a, a drink. Yeah. And he's he's a drunk because he has PTSD from the war and because of he was kidnapped by these same aliens. Now, I do want to talk about that. Okay. Um, let, let, let's go there. But we'll we'll put a pin in that for now. Okay. But just to finish driving home this point is that I like that they take these these characters that are clearly at odds with each other, throw them together, and we have because this again highlights the human element of the apocalypse. Well, the only ones that really are at odds, and I understand I understand your point. The only ones that are really at odds are Levinson and um, Whitmore, the president. Yeah, that's fair. Where where I, Will where um Hillard played by Will Smith and um, Russell Case played by Quaid, they don't even really know each other. Yeah, but it's if not at does, odds is really not the right way to say that. It's really just, just people, from, people from different stations in life. Correct. And what you see here is like at the end of the world, none of that shit is going to matter. It really doesn't because you figure at first Whitmore wanted nothing to do with Levinson right. at all. But as soon as he says, I know why we have satellite disruption, it's like, okay, I'm the leader of the free world. I need to listen to what this guy has to say. Because he knows Levinson's um, credentials. He knows how right. smart he is. So it's like, well, I need to listen to this guy. Yeah, so now let's go back to your uh, last point uh, that Randy Quaid Russell case uh, is uh, was and kidnapped. I feel so bad for his character, too. I because agree. He, I mean, let, let's just, you know, we're, we're touch on, in, even dealing with that, when you see how he's, looked at by the people in his town you know they they make fun of this guy for having ptsd they like make fun of him he's a joke to these people because you see earlier on in the first act he dusts the wrong field he's a crop duster that dusts the wrong field and then it's like oh yeah you were kidnapped by aliens well did they do any sexual experiments on (laughs) you and these guys are yucking it up yeah and they actually went on tv and embarrassed and him yeah, and yeah. said that. And it's like, why? Like, what is it about you that you're really going to try to embarrass this guy on TV like Yeah, that? man, the movie just does such a good job with those little moments. And you said it best, right? It, it doesn't waste any, it doesn't waste a single second of its time. Um, if it's not showing us a big action set piece or it's not building tension, then it is developing these characters and their relationships with each other. Exactly. Uh, what I like, wanted to go to is mm-hmm. whether or not you think he was actually abducted by aliens. I think he was because they seem to know an awful lot about how to pick people apart and how to pick these. So they probably to learn about them, they probably did kidnap him like, and probably other people. He just was the one that yeah, he was just the one that really he was constantly talking about it. And you figure what he saw during Vietnam coupled with that is probably why he was so eccentric and drinking himself like crazy and why he was so hell bent on fighting. Yeah, I agree with that. I've always sort of read that as just part of his PTSD and a coping strategy for what he went through. Um, And I think that we have to be careful because let's say aliens really show up right Mm -hmm. Uh, on the planet. Then how many people are going to be like, I told y'all they they kidnapped me back in 1982. But like how many of those people were actually kidnapped in 1982 and how many of them have just been claiming it and they're just happy that they finally have some proof? That's a good point by you. That is a very good point by you. (laughs) Uh, Because I think that it's really plausible that as someone suffering from PTSD, he has recast his captors in the Vietnam War as aliens in order to cope with the trauma that he holds on to. That's a good point. It's almost like... He's like, yeah. no human being could do that to me. It had to be something else. Right. And I think that... You know what's funny is that Russell Case could have easily been Rambo. Mm-hmm. If you think about it with that PTSD, it's just yeah. that he went another way. Yeah. Yeah. And so his redemption arc is pretty great because like we said, he's not liked. And here's a great, a great example of a, by all metrics, a minor character that gets 
a lot of attention and has a really great story arc. Right. And it's like it's almost like if anyone else played this character, it wouldn't have worked. Right. Because it's like he he's still lovable. Like this is a guy that people would probably be looking down on because, you know, his kids look down on. They don't take him seriously. His son calls him by his first name, for God's sake. That is the ultimate epitome of disrespect to me. And then it's, yeah. but you still love this guy. It's like, oh, he's so funny and blah, blah, blah. And he is so clearly doing the best he can to deal with all of his demons. Mm-hmm. And he But sees, he still loves his kids. He doesn't absolutely. take it out on them. And he sees this invasion and he sees that final action set piece as his opportunity to, to right the wrongs, right? Absolutely. And it's almost like as soon as he realizes what's going to happen... First, he tries to warn people, and then when he gets out, it's like he's getting his kids to get the hell away from those things. It's like he's still being sloppy and weird, but he's using that military tactic. Okay, I need to alert people. Now I got to get my family and get the hell out of here. Even though he's drunk, he's very clear-headed, Yeah. and he's able to make good decisions. And you even see that with his kids. You know, they're getting ready to leave without him. And then all of a sudden, it's like the kids go back to taking his lead, mm -hmm. which is really, really amazing. This is great character building. This It does an amazing job because we see from Russell's perspective and then with, you know, if you don't mind, you know, changing gears to another character and let's keep it with sort of his dynamic going to Will Smith, the opposite end. This is a guy who's in the military now. And he's in the you know the top of his game. He's in a relationship that, you know, because people look down on you know people that are in the sex industry and you know in erotic dancers, and you know even his best friend tells him you're not going to get the fly for NASA yeah. if you marry a stripper, and you know he's staying with her and you know whatever. And of course he has his own bit of charm, but he shows the fear of what's happening. But then it's like, he defaults to that military thinking as well. Yeah. I've been called back to base. This is what I need to do. You need to stop tripping because this is what needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's all, it's all just really good. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on, um, on this other character and we've talked about him before a lot already, but I want to really talk to him, talk about him rather. Mm -hmm. um, President Thomas J. Whitmore <laughs> great president or greatest president? <laughs> um, and who would you take, him or Martin Sheen's Josiah Bartlett? Um, I'm sticking with President Whitmore just for the fact that he fought with he, – he was like a real leader. He fought with his men. Yeah, can you imagine? Now, we've had presidents that served in the military, clearly, yeah. in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels like it's been a minute. It's been a long ass time since we've had a military president. I think the closest that we've come in the last little bit was uh, John, John McCain. Kerry. Oh, John McCain. Yeah, John McCain would have. John been. McCain, because he was a he's a Viet, he was a Vietnam War vet. God rest yeah, his soul. and he did and he did run against Obama, and that was more recent. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And um, but yeah, it, that moment when at the end, so. Bill Pullman's great moments in this movie, there are so many. He was definitely not Lone Star in this movie. No. <laughs> he def but I mean, even just his interaction with his wife and his kid, he's very, very tactical, even when he's just joking. And once again, you see that military mindset. And even when he's hearing how he's being like talked about and second guessed, he's just like, handling it with chillness like isn't it funny how they always seem to gang up on you yeah and he has this really great uh he reminds me a little bit of kyle chandler you know who that is um oh. kyle chandler played the coach on friday night lights the tv show. okay gotcha gotcha um and he was in godzilla the new godzilla film uh he is so good kyle chandler at demonstrating uh like with facial expressions the process of thinking through a problem. Yeah, I I agree. He he and, ponders very well. And Bill Pullman does that in this role really well as well. You like he's a pragmatic leader, and you can read that pragmatism on his face. 
Right. And he's honest. Unlike yeah. most poli- – how most politicians are looked at, he's very honest. Yeah. He's kind of a JFK type, right? Because he's young. Um, he's young. He's idealistic. Kind of radical, but doesn't really – yeah, and a lot Rock of the people the that criticize him early on before we even get into the disaster stuff, their criticisms of him are all age-related. Right, and that's really all they have. They don't have anything else. And it also kind of goes to show how we are in our society. Granted, yes, you should give your elders the respect and listen to them, but there's something to be said about listening to the young as yeah, well. Yeah, there are some good ideas in, in young people for sure. They, they don't they don't say out of the ba- out of the mouths of babes for nothing. No. Uh and he uh also probably would lose reelection because a lot I I imagine a lot of his voters were probably located in LA and New York City. Yeah, he, he you think you think he was the uh, benefit of the electoral college? No, I think that he was probably a really popular Democratic candidate. Yeah, um, being that young. That's true. That's and true. radical, you know. But um, it's crazy to me how he has the respect of the grizzled old um, military man and Robert Loja. Yeah, well, and Robert Loja uh, <laughs> would respect him. It. Because they, because he is a military person too, you know. So, right. Um, you, he will have the respect of the military folk, uh, I would assume at least. Well, you notice that the military guys all had respect for him. The only person in his cabinet that really didn't show him much respect was the shithead uh, Lip Zicky, Lip yeah. Dicky. I used to call him <laughs> Lip Dicky, Nim Zicky, Nim Zicky, Lip Dicky. <laughs> who he's the only one that really doesn't show the president a lot of respect because he's a former head of the CIA and the CIA, they're not like, um, you know, your standard military guys. These are the guys that know all the deep down dirty little secrets. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he, he's the one that knew about the aliens. He had all the knowledge at the very beginning and he, said nothing yeah they uh whenever they go to area 51 because there is we we see here a ship that they've recovered it from the 50s and also uh three bodies yeah and the president was not let in on this and they say plausible deniability but this guy uh yeah you're right is is the guy that sort of keeps it away from uh from the president well did you ever did you notice though that in the movie and this is something that i picked up on this last viewing you notice that every single time he makes a decision, it's wrong. Every time he speaks on something, he's wrong. Yeah. Like, because remember, the president goes, maybe we should go to DEFCON 3. You know, that's a great idea. You call and say, we're going to DEFCON 3. And Robert Loja goes, that's not what the president said. Right. And then. Yeah, he's like, trying to run the show. You get the sense that this guy really wants to be president. Right. And, he, uh, and honestly, he probably lost in the primaries. He probably did. And and um, Whitmore just kept him around because he is politically savvy. Right. But every idea he has is wrong. Every time he tries to add to something, it's wrong. And he's made to look foolish. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I th- this this guy just really like I hate this character. He's the only he's like probably the only character in this whole movie that I deeply despise. Like, I really wish that he would have been like I wish there was a deleted scene where, you know, everything is okay now. And he's got to leave Area 51 and they only give him like a two liter, you know, no, a a two, (laughs) a two gallon thing of water and say, walk your ass to the next town. Yeah, I think they should just make him stay there. Yeah, just leave him there with Dr. Oaken. Yeah. Uh, you is that is Doctor Oaken uh the that's Data is that Weird Al yeah Data no. Brett Spiner Who's, who was Doctor Weird Al Yankovic you mean Brett the guy who was like over the last twenty four hours have been really excited yeah 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 is that yeah him? that's Doctor Oaken yeah that's oh, Brett Spiner yeah I did not that's recognize him with that long hair I was like yeah he looks nothing like Data the back then only yeah. anyone every only everyone only knew him in as Data right poor guy. Yeah, no, he was a lot of fun, and you know the. I want to have one moment here for we we talked about the the pacing and the patience 
but there the movie never really um it, it never really uh, blows its load on the aliens like we never have a scene where a whole bunch of aliens are just running around you know no uh, not at all and anytime we see the aliens, it's, they're always shattered, like they're always in shadows or in strobe lights or whatever. And so they do a good job of well, they're hiding. Just in right, exactly. And and I think that that the film is sort of sci-fi action suspense comedy. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that because like the only time we ever really see the aliens are we see the 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 big alien on the mothership. Yeah. We see the alien that Will Smith punches in the grill piece, and then yeah. They but do- remember that even though the thing that Will Smith punches is is still it's the a- Enviro suit. Yeah. So how hard of a punch was that? I don't know. That's sort of that's that's one of my like plot holes. For yeah. This, is that he punched that thing so hard? Did it give the thing inside a concussion? Because I mean, he break his hand. Because here's the thing, man. Like the the guy had a straight shot on one of these aliens and it still took three rounds to kill it like will smith just punched his exosuit and knocked him out <laughs> so how how what was will smith channeling his inner muhammad ali before he even right. the movie? <laughs> i know he was ripped but man like i feel like that is a little bit of a problem especially hard enough to knock him out for five hours well it was the adrenaline shane yeah you're right <laughs> it was the adrenaline plus you know you could probably make someone could probably try to make the argument Oh, well, he was stunned because of the crash, and then he got punched by Will Smith. No. He had never seen a, another creature with a head shaped like a circle. Yeah. Will, Will Smith just brought – you know what it is? Is that off camera – and this was in another deleted scene, Shane. I wasn't sure if you uh, knew about it or not. Got it. But Will Smith was all of a sudden worthy of Mjolnir. Uh, so he got the power of Thor. So it sounds like before the the Disney Fox purchase went through, Independence Day is MCU. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. Um, Independence Day is an actually an MCU property retroactively from back 23 years ago. Yes. Here's, here's my least. Here's my favorite <laughs> MCU favorite game to play with Brian. Okay. <laughs> it's Hey Shane. Did you find? Did you hear that character X is a Disney princess now? And oh yeah, I or, do do that now. Or hey, or hey, how about you know? Hey, you know who's in uh, who's in the MCU now? And it's like, yo, that's just really not how it works, Brian. But like, <laughs> well, it is now. In my mind, that's how it right. works. Yeah, in your mind, that's how it works. Yeah, well, um, the, that that means that. We now have a stripper as a Disney princess. <laughs> right. And I think like I think my I think my point is just everyone can't be a princess. <laughs> hey. Like hey, Marty could be a princess. Marty no. McFly? No, Marty from the movie. Oh. He can be a princess. Marty from the movie. Yeah. Um and Harvey Firestein. So. Harvey Firestein. Um David. David. Yeah. Why did he, I just send my mother to Atlanta? He, he does trip me <laughs> out, man. I love, his, I love his character so much. Right. Yeah, he's you know, excellent. I, what, what I really love about him is that you never have to make it a point, oh, that's a gay guy. It's like right. he's just so awesome to have on screen that yeah. it's like, well, it's he's, he's gay, so what? He's a cool yeah. ass dude. Also, but, want to have a shout out for um, Judd Hirsch. Who Judd Hirsch a, is he is comic gold in yeah, this movie. He is, <laughs> but also has a really nice touching moment too. You know when uh, I haven't spoken to God since your mother died. Right when when Le, when David is is drunk and freaking out and everything, they have like a really nice father son interaction, which is really cool. It it yeah. it's really nice. It's really heartfelt. And what I really love is how he – you want to talk about a badass dad, man. When I think of – like, number one, Judge, when I first watched this movie as an adult, not as a teenager, mm-hmm. I was like, wow, he's being a real stereotypical Jewish character. And then it's like, nah, this dude is raw because – they're they're young because you know David is like you know as soon as they start mentioning nudes David is flipping out on Air Force One and they're like you shut up you're a guest here and he was like hey 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 
You don't tell him to shut up. You yeah. would be dead now if it wasn't for my David. And as soon as he talks, everyone listens. Yeah, no, he is he is a little raw for sure. That's a good way to put it. He like he looks out for his own. And what's great about him is that he gives he gives David shit when it's just them two. But it's that whole like I'll make fun of you because you're mine, but other folks right. think that not. I, he even I love how the very beginning he was like, man, if I knew I'd have been meeting the president, I would have won a tie. I feel like I shlamil. But then. <laughs> As soon as they get to Area 51, where do you get funding for this? You don't think they spend $20,000 for a toilet seat, $30,000 for a hammer, do you? It's like, he's and then just, I think, and then like the president not. looks at him as though to say, You right. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> Wow, you just made me feel real dumb. Right. <laughs> and it was so good, even at the end where he's doing the prayer circle. But I'm not Jewish. No one's perfect. <laughs> he does not miss a beat. Yeah, he's excellent. I love J Judd Hirsch, man. He is so great in this movie. He yeah. really is. And um, even still, even when he and he inadvertently, and you want to talk about people that help inspire genius. David had no clue what he was gonna do, and his father just says something so simple as, "Get off this cold floor before you catch cold." Yep. A virus. Now, you talking about plot holes. <laughs> you want to talk can, can, can we talk about the big plot hole in the room the big elephant plot in the room yeah what's that a cold isn't a virus <laughs> yeah number one a cold is not a virus number one number two how in the hell could a mac from 1996 interface with alien technology to deliver a virus yeah i mean i, I we should re report though that a cold is a virus but oh it is it is yeah well, I'm um object. The common cold, also known simply as a cold, is a viral infectious disease of the upper respiratory tract that primarily affects the nose. Well, Shane, that is why I am not in medicine. The okay? more you know. Now, here ah. is, uh, here's what I'll, I'll say for you um, for the, like, the Mac thing, the plot hole thing. Okay. Um, I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibility, and here's why I say that. There's still like the code that he's able to intercept is still just binary code. So like it's like if they're using machinery, then the machinery still on on some level has to be a machine, you know? Okay, I can I can get down with that. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water. No, that's fine. No. Um, um I mean, but no, that 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 okay. You know what? I never thought of it that way. Considering I mean, the they're fact not trying to run Fortnite on that Mac. They're just trying to upload a virus. <laughs> right. Well, not only that, but they also, they hid their disruptor signal in our satellites. So they had to know, they so they probably had to downgrade their technology to be able to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Now, I don't want to spend too much time tugging at that thread well, because you're right. Like there, I mean, that is that a loose end for sure. But at the same time, the good guys had to win, right? Somehow. Yeah, and you. And there's no Snake Plissken to do it for us. <laughs> right, and there's no there's no getting through those shields unless. And I thought it was really smart to have this Area 51 revelation where we got a ship, and it turned back on when they came into the into the atmosphere. I thought that was really cool. That was and, really. Cool. Right, and so it's really smart to have a fighter pilot in the cast. It's really you know like all the pieces were there. So sure, like there's a logical leap that we have to take to say like our our technology is going to be able to like put a virus on this thing, right? Right. Um. Well, but well, see, I especially love too. Just just one thing, I, I really feel like I have to touch on. Yeah. I really love the whole when David and his father are going to Washington D.C. He was like, they're the government. You think they don't know what you know? Oh, they know. They don't know this. Oh, yeah, sure. You're going to educate them. Yeah, okay. You, you you went to MIT for four years to become a TV cable repairman. You know what? <laughs> they have people to take care of these things. They want HBO, they'll call you. It's like, wow, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good bit, too. That was so I think good. that we would be remiss if we didn't also give Bill Pullman his due on that big speech. Oh, my. Every time I hear that speech... I want to run through a wall. I, I want to punch someone in the face. I am I don't so pumped. know that I can name another speech unless I think it's better than the freaking Braveheart speech. Yeah. 
I mean, I agree. You know what? Maybe if I were Scottish, I would probably. We're gonna have to ask um Issa McLaren, who is Scottish, yeah. which one is better because you know she has the Scottish pride. So maybe maybe the Braveheart speech speaks to her more. Well, what's beautiful about the Independence Day speech is that it speaks to everyone. Right. It's a speech about humanity, which is what's so beautiful about it. But man, Bill Pullman delivers the fuck out of that speech. Oh hell yeah! Do you have a clip of that? Yeah, I was I was gonna start the show with it, but I'll start the show with something else. Yeah, let's listen in to Bill Pullman uh, deliver the speech. Good morning. Good morning. In less than an hour, aircraft for me. Oh, I got chills. You know, every time. And, you know, I think I know this speech pretty well. Like, it's not going to affect me this time. But even today when I heard that speech, I was ready to run through a wall, like you said. It just oh, chill, man. This, this I speech, get chills. This this is the speech where this is the, the inspirational speech to end all inspirational speeches. I mean, I'm sorry, man. Um, Newt Rockney's speech about the Gipper and blah, blah, blah. Screw that. Who cares? Man, Frickin it's just, it's it's wow. so, it's refreshing, which is I mean, a weird thing to say in 2019 when this movie came out in 1996. It's refreshing to hear a president talk about mankind instead of Americans. That is leadership right there. That's yeah. leadership. You know what? All other presidents, that's where you take advice. If I were to ever become president of the United States, I'm going to be like President Whitmore. I'm so. just not I'm just not going to learn how to fly a plane because I don't do heights. Yeah, he just But I'll drive the shit out of a bus though. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. They're <laughs> like they're like President Tan, what are you doing? You're like, I'm a bus driver. I got to get back out there. <laughs> I've got to get these kids to school, damn it. Right. It's a they will not strike. take their education. They are going to know that the future is theirs through the power of books. Today is their Independence Day. I gotta tell you. I have myself up with that one. I I I've gotta tell you, and this is because I'm your friend and I love you. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm expecting a compliment. It's like, <laughs> you, were, you really channeled your inner nib high school principal on that right, one. Right. You just awarded me no points and, made, and asked God to have mercy on my yep. soul. Oh, bum, man. Bum, ba, da, yeah. You're sitting here telling these kids that you're taking them to school and it's their Independence Day. That don't make no sense. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good point. Well, you know what? Forget it. I was rolling. Okay. <laughs> I was Bluto Blutarski. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, man, that was funny. That was um, that was great. <laughs> uh, Burn! So, yeah, so then you get this big final action set piece, and man, I think that's the movie. It's just really good. I mean, really what else is. can you say about it? I mean, well, let, let, let's let's jump. Let, let, let's hopscotch back for a second. Yeah. Will Smith drops the alien off at Area 51. He wants to get back to El Toro because he's hoping Jasmine's going to be there because he doesn't know what happened to her. She doesn't know what happened to him. She gets to El Toro and finds it destroyed. And then he's told El Toro's destroyed, and he decides to steal a helicopter and fly from Area 51 back to Southern California yeah. to El Toro. And the one big Jack Marine, what the hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> yeah. Something I got to do. Just tell him I hit you. And he yeah. looks at him like, the hell are you going to do to me? Right. Dude, <laughs> that dude. This guy just knocked out an alien with an yeah. exosuit. That's he a might, good point. He might punch you. He might punch you so hard you look like Huey's girlfriend when A Train got done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had to make a boys reference because, by the way, if you haven't seen the boys on Amazon Prime, you're doing yourself a disservice. It is most excellent. We still it, haven't really, really talked about it, but we need to. We definitely need to. Uh, well, Brian, you know. let's get into it. Let's have uh, Mr. Bartender Smiley tell the people about our rating system. Smiley! The Plotaholics rating system for the movies is a pretty simple system. Basically, they rate movies based on how many shots it takes to get through them. So if you got a good movie and you get through it all the way sober, then it takes zero shots to get through the movie. 
and then if you got a really bad movie then it could take up to five shots to get through the whole thing i think you can try to figure out the middle part yourself so what can i get you all right thank you smiley uh brian i thought for a moment here we might do something a little different to kick off the rating system uh the rating part of the show all right um this show this film uh rather is currently sitting on rotten tomatoes at a 65 percent uh tomato meter yeah now it's a 75 percent audience score um now you got to film though Keep in mind that Rotten Tomatoes is an aggregate site that collects all of the reviews that they have available for uh, for a movie. Right. And so there are only 71 reviews available online from what Rotten Tomatoes would consider a credible place, right? Remember the movie came out in 96, so most of these right. reviews are going to have to be done several years later to even count. Right. Um, so 96, uh, 65 rather on Rotten Tomatoes. I wanted to read you some of the blurbs from the negative reviews. All right, give it to me. Uh, Tim Brayton from something called Antagony and Ecstasy. If this guy can be on here, why can't we be on Rotten Tomatoes? I'm serious, man. You know I'm what? Gonna, look, I'm, I'm going to s- apply. But All here's right. the thing. Here's the thing. They have for podcasts, you can apply as a podcast, but there are some pretty stringent guidelines okay, that we'll have to go over. I think it's mostly that we have to post regularly every week for like a year or something. Well, so we, we've been doing that so far for the last. Well, no, we have to post a podcast a week for a year. Oh, well, OK. So this time next year, we'll be able to do it. Yeah. So we'll be applying for Rotten Tomatoes soon. But here we go. Tim oh, Brady. snap. Oh, snap. Before before we forget, before we forget, Harry Connick Jr. Oh, yeah, Jimmy, right. Jimmy Wilder, Will Smith's best friend. You know who was supposed to play that role? I know um, you know. Well, I don't. I'm thinking because okay, you said that he played Will Smith's best friend, right? Yes. So very it funny. would have to be somebody that's very good at playing a friend. Yeah, a very a masterful job of playing. Would it a have been uh let's see, would it have been friend of the show Courtney Cox? Close. So uh, close. Almost it, sexually transmitted close. Oh, ooh, okay. Could it have been uh ooh oh Burt Reynolds? <laughs> <laughs> Almost. It was okay, a- all right. <laughs> <laughs> Very close. Could it have been oh Dolph Lundgren? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I could see Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren probably can fly a plane too. Probably. Actually, Dolph Lundgren picks up planes and just. I was about to say and just throws yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I so think you're close. referring to so Matthew Perry. Yes, Chandler Bing himself was supposed to play Marine Corps Captain Jimmy Wilder. Now, don't you think that this was maybe the break that Matthew Perry needed to get into film? Well, I'm pretty sure that he got to be married to uh, Salma Hayek in a movie, so I think he's doing okay. I mean, yeah, and he's still riding off a friend's money, so I think he's going to be fine. Hey, no one told him life was going to be that way. No. (laughs) (laughs) I love, I've got to tell you, one of my favorite recurring bits on this show is how often we talk about friends, even though we aren't even really that big of fans of that show. We really aren't, but it seems like every movie has sort of a friend's something in it. So I think we we have to start a new connection called Six Degrees of Friend Separation. Okay, fair enough. Now, if, if we're going to do this, are we going to do it? Is it just from the six leads or is it just anyone who's been it in the show? It can be anyone that was ever on Friends. Oh, well, then we've got tons of people for that. Just We can even do Burt Reynolds to that. I know. That's what I just said. It's so <laughs> awesome. All right. So we'll, we'll start doing that with the next episode. That's right. We should It should be good. Um, here are some of your negative reviews from uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Again, Tim Brayton from Antagony and Ecstasy says, It's an utter slog, and there's nothing worse to say about a movie whose entire solitary purpose in life is to, vri- is to provide mindless, violent escapism. Four out of ten. Who, who gave that review? His What's name his is name? Tim Brayton. Well, Tim's a douche. Yeah. Jason Bailey from Flavor Wire says a loathsome, soulless husk of a garbage movie. A wow. bad movie then, and it's a bad movie now. Wow. Well, someone's flavor is salt. Yes. Yes. Uh, Felix Vasquez Jr. from Cinema says 
one quarter of a very decent, albeit cliche, alien invasion film, and three quarters an unwatchable adventure film. You know what? Felix can kiss my ass. See, <laughs> this is why, you know what? You know who this, you know why this guy Felix doesn't like this movie? That? I'll tell you why. Because Felix was named after the character Felix Barbosa from Deep Cover. That was and that character was in the movie with David Jensen, who was played by Jeff Goldblum. And Jeff Goldblum shot him in both hands and then shot him in the ass and then kicked him out of a damn limo. And then he got hit because he looked like a Los Lobo stage prop in the middle of the street. So that's why Felix doesn't like this movie. You can kiss my ass, Felix. Whew. And I, I even brought some inside jokes for my buddies because basically, well, I'll talk to you about it after the show. I gotcha. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to point out really quick in the in for the sake of our new segment, Six Degrees of Friend Separation, okay. that Jeff Goldblum actually was in an episode of Friends. He yes. played Leonard Hayes, a director uh, that Joey yes. was uh, auditioning for. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> So there's. <laughs> oh my god, it's so great. Um, we did it, and we we did it, we did it. We did it. So um, we did it, we did it twice. Honestly, one degree of friend separation this week. Absolutely. Um. All right. So Brian, we've heard what some of the detractors say. Um. There are a ton of positive reviews on Rotten Tomatoes from critics, but what say you? You know. This movie stands the test of time from the set pieces, the the special effects, the acting. These characters are going to live forever because they're all – they're as likable now in 2019 as they were in 1996. They're – it's just an amazing film. It's very well written, amazing pacing, great character development, amazing story arcs. The only things that really get to me as far as, <clears throat> excuse me, as sort of plot holes, and even with your explanation, and it, it's a very, very sound explanation, and I can get down with it, but still, the, the whole computer virus dropping still kind of gets to me a little bit. I'm a little bit better with it now than I was before, but still... And then there was another um, plot hole that we sort of brought up, but it's sort of eluding me right now. But of the a two and a half hour movie, only one oh the Will Smith punch in the alien yeah, thing. Yeah, that's you know, the big one. For so me. The, those are two pretty big plot holes for me. But two plot holes or two things that make no sense in a two and a half hour epic science film, fiction film. Science fiction film. I'm gonna give this a one shot rating. I yeah. don't really – I mean I would get a buzz with it just so those two glaring things wouldn't bother me. Yeah. Now, those two things don't bother me as a viewer of this film. Um, the, the the Will Smith punching the alien bothered me this time as an adult more than it ever did when I was a kid. Because I think when I was a kid, I was a kid, you know? And, right. Same here. And I don't even know that it really – connected in my brain that when he punched that thing he wasn't punching the alien you know what i mean correct uh so that that never really bothered me that sort of stuck out stuck out to me this time uh the technology thing has never bothered me because you just you can't hold a science fiction film up to that kind of standard it's not trying to be realistic and and the good guys have to win somehow so that also never really bothers me. That's not to say that that's not a valid criticism. It's just not something that, that I try to like hold on to too much. But I'm absolutely with you. I think it's a one-shotter. Um, does it get bogged down a little bit? Maybe in the third act, as we're starting to build toward that, like in the in the gap between trying the nuke out and figuring out the virus stuff, like does it start to sag a little bit? Maybe. Maybe but, a little. But does that it pad be, the runtime a little? Yeah, but that's really it, man. And um, I enjoy it. If you if you're a fan of invasion films, if you're a fan of action, science fiction, I love this movie. I have a great time watching it, and I'm right with you. One shot for me as well. Yeah, it's probably if this film doesn't do well, I think Will Smith is still able to have a great career. But this movie really cemented his place very early on, where other 
um, actors such as The Rock needed, you know, a couple of films to really help solidify them. Same with Vin Diesel. Will Smith, he got it. He he had the luxury of having one film no one really knew too much about. One film where he was the support, but the leads helped make the comedy. And then a nice, quiet indie flick. And then boom. So th- this is a great movie. This is a movie that, like I said already, it stands the test of time in all things considered. You feel like you're either in 1996 or the movie takes place in 2019. It's just that timeless to me. Minus yeah. the whole Viet, minus the Vietnam references and the Desert Storm references. Right. Yeah, and uh, I, I think it, it absolutely does stand the test of time. And honestly, a little ahead of its time with what, um, you know, the war on terror uh, veterans are dealing with, with PTSD and things like that. I mean, absolutely. We're, we're much more aware of that now than than we were even in 96. And, so. I'm very, and I'm very grateful for that because, you know, our servicemen and women, they go through a lot. They see things that, you know – your everyday person is not going to be able to handle. And I feel that the Russell Case character, much like Thor in Endgame, you you sort of, when you really take the time to think about it, you kind of want to, you feel so terrible for the character and what they must have seen and what they've gone through yeah. to be at that point. But he, he has a great, you know, definitely kudos to Randy Quaid for his role in this movie because he is like, he's the hero. If it's yeah. not for him, the good guys don't win. You know, it's, um, and not to fire us down too much, but it's always a little jolting for me to see uh, the World Trade Center in skyline shots. It really is. It, it, it still hurt. It still hurts. It does. And and when you see it in this movie, and especially the way that these uh, aliens attack our planet, I think that it's a, it was interesting that they decided to, have this ship attack the Empire State Building and not the World Trade Center. And I think that the movie is able to escape maybe some of that sort of like retreading that we see happen sometimes when disasters hit. Right. Um, where maybe they try to go back and retcon some scenes or take or edit that out of a future version. Right. Um, but it's still it still stays there and it's great. And, I- yeah, and it's also it is in, in a post 9-11 world, those disaster scenes hit a little harder uh, because in this film, we were attacked from the sky and they attacked our buildings, you know? Right. Well, I think a part of the reason why the the um, ship went to the Empire State Building instead of the World Trade Center was because we well, from when the film was made, we were only like a year and a half from the 1993 World Trade Center bomb. Right. That makes sense. So they probably did, they probably didn't want to reference that too much. Well, and it's also if you think about it from a cinematic perspective, uh, which is probably a cold way to think about it. The Empire but, State Building is a much better shot. It's a better shot, yeah. And and you don't you can't position that ship with its laser coming out of that one place in the bottom. You can't center that over the World Trade Center. No, but uh, you can like do. Right, and so I think that the shot is it's a better shot over the over the Empire State Building. It's just anytime I see films where the world trade center is still in the skyline it's uh, hard it's very it's, it hard. surprises me it always it, surprises me i get choked up I, like i noticed you know when you see the devastation in new york post alien attack yeah. and you see the world trade center burning like i still i still remember where i was you know um you know september 11 2001 i still remember watching it i remember the the terror so it really brought back a lot, and it just made me appreciate the innocence of 1996. You know, we were yeah. five years away from our world changing forever. Yeah. So, um, and you know what's interesting? St- Go ahead. And, well, I was going to say, you even look at the original King Kong compared to the 1977 remake, you know, where in the original King Kong, he climbs the World Trade Center and that has a lot more sort of gravitas for me than the remake where he climbs World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not anywhere near as jarring. Yeah. As when he climbed the Empire State Building. Right. Yeah. Um. There's just something about the Empire State Building. Also, I think just the way that it looks is 
cool. Like the World Trade Center was always really tall and impressive, but it was boxy. Right. Where the Empire State Building, it's like a point. It's like yeah. a big finger pointing to the heavens. Yeah. Uh, you know uh, what else New York City uh, had a big part in? Um, football. Yes, but also a little show called Friends. Ah, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, and you want to know another thing that we can connect friends with in this movie? Yeah, what's that? May Whitman, who plays Patricia Whitmore, was oh. friends. Uh, that's right. So, yeah, th this movie has a lot of friends connections. Harry Connick Jr. was even in Friends at one point. Man. You know, is Independence Day friends in space? I think Question so. Mark? <laughs> I, I think, well, I think what it is is that Independence Day – is Earth 616 friends. You know, I'm going to need somebody to edit a friends like intro for Independence Day. <laughs> that would be so great. <laughs> I'm going to, well, I know what I'm doing over my Labor Day weekend. So, <laughs> uh, told you Earth was going to be this way. Pew, 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 pew. Um, all right. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Oh, this God. is, uh, ha speaking of Labor Day, happy Labor Day, everybody. That's happy when you're, uh, that's when. This is uh, releasing uh, next week. Uh, you'll, we're, not, we're in the middle of our weekly releases now, so next week you'll be able to tune in and hear uh, the second week of Will Smith Timber, and we'll be doing Men in Black. That is like the one dance that I can do. I can't do the electric slide, but I can do the Men in Black dance. That makes sense. Cause it's real easy. You just bounce a whip. You just bounce a whip me. Come on and take a walk with me. Take a walk with me, and then make your network. Now scream. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry. Yeah. I, got I think it. we should have to. I think one of the videos that we have to upload next week for the Plotaholics on YouTube is Brian Tan's dance grooves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not going to be anywhere near as good as Napoleon Dynamites, but I can do my best. Brian Tan's dance moves just, it's, it should just be like a side-by-side -side of you and Will Smith doing <laughs> the <laughs> dance. You know what? I'm pretty sure if you asked Sharon, she'd make me do it. <laughs> nice. Uh, so oh. Men in Black uh, next week, then Bad Boys, then Wild Wild West, and I Am Legend. Uh, soon we will be releasing our polls to decide our uh, Halloween films for October, so be on the lookout for that. Absolutely, it's gonna be great, man. I'm telling you, man. The plot, we are growing, we are evolving, and going into 2020, we gonna be bringing the real shizzle. That's right, that's right. And if you want to stay abreast of all of the things that are happening with the Plotaholics, you can follow us. Uh, go to Plotaholics.com is the easiest way to get in touch with us. Uh, it'll link you out to all of our social media. YouTube and everything. Stay on the lookout for our live weekly show on Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube. Every Tuesday. At 7 Eastern time in the PM. Uh, Brian, I think I'm going to have some uh, info from Dragon Con uh, for next week. Ooh. Uh, I'll be down there for at least one of those days. I'm trying to get to the Gotham, Orville, and maybe the Lucifer panel. You and the um, great Joe Compton will be. Uh, that's right. Well, so our Joe friend Joe Compton from Go Indie Now. Joe and I will be linking up on Friday night as well sometime. So word up. Yeah. So um yeah, anything else you've got uh you got going on over there? Um September tenth, which is only a couple of weeks away, we'll be able to get the uh, re release of my very first novel, The Enforcer. Now keep in mind, Joe um Shane and I are writers. We don't want to use the show to sort of be a commercial, but if we do have something coming up, we you know, we'll we'll sort of throw that out there. Um, also on my personal Facebook, you'll see, um, not, um, September 8th, I will be doing a performance at the Hard Rock Cafe here in Pittsburgh. I'm actually going to be performing, um, It's Not Over by Daughtry, because I take, uh, music lessons, I play the bass, so you can nice. be able to check that out, watch the video, and tell me how much I suck and make fun of me. That'll be awesome. Very good. Um, as for me... Uh, not a whole lot on the calendar currently, uh, working on plotaholic stuff. I will, I'm still working on edits on the stage play. So hopefully I can get a production of that up, uh, in the next little bit Woo. and, uh, some music stuff, but you can always find all of my stuff over at shanewilsonauthor.com. So, uh, Shane Wilson. 
That's right. Hey, man, uh, it was a good episode. I enjoyed it. Oh, this was a lot of fun. I liked the more freewheeling, less plot-driven discussion. Yeah, because, I mean, if you guys have watched the movie, you know what I mean? We, we can, you know, we can still make it fun and have fun with it and, you know, go from yeah, there. Absolutely. I, I tell my students all the time that I'm more interested in what they think about something than just telling me what it was about. Yeah, uh, and I don't so need you to tell should, me what it's about. Yeah, what we should you... use the same the same criticism for ourselves. So moving forward, I think we'll probably do more character storytelling type stuff than we've done in the past. Like today. Today was really good. I agree. And it went very, very smoothly and it didn't have to take forever in a day to do. And we found at least three, maybe four connections to friends, which is always good. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So imagine what we're going to find next. week. Oh, here's a question for you. OK. In the past, and this will be this will be our last little bit. In the past, we've identified Will Smith almost being Neo as a near miss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Also in the near miss catalog, what was the second one? Oh crap! Um, it was the John Cusack thing. Oh right, right. Um, shit, I can't remember now. We'll have to ah. go back and listen. It's in one of the past episodes. But do you consider the Harry Connick Jr. Matthew Perry a near miss. Yes, I do. I'll, I'll call that a near miss. That, Is that, that was... worthy of the Hall of Near Miss fame? No, I don't think it's because the, the character Jimmy wasn't really all that important. Honestly, the character Even was kind though of he annoying. almost proposed to Will Smith. He did almost <laughs> propose to Will Smith while he was trying to show him the proper way to kiss ass to get ahead in the world. That's right. That's but, right. I, but, 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 but Hall of Near Miss, no, nah, because honestly... The character Jimmy sort of got on my nerves. Yeah, and he's pretty interchangeable. You put just about anybody in that part. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we probably could have put Don the Dragon Wilson in there. No, or else. Burt Reynolds. Or Burt Reynolds, but Burt Reynolds <laughs> is also the man. So that's right. Um, <laughs> all right, hey, Sandler's Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> that was. Uh, I think that's gonna wrap it up for us for tonight, man. For the Plotaholics, I'm Shane Wilson, and I'm Brian Tan, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Good night. Take a trip with us to New Bog. Just promise not to drink the goo. Oh my God. If you get sucked into the Matrix, Matrix, we will send the phone for you. Do you believe in fate? Sometimes the end game is the perfect place to start. We're in the end game now. And other times you want to pretend the prequels were. Never a real thing. Let's just pie race to the end. It's working! Every movie has a plot hole. And every hole gets filled somehow. Whiskey, wine, or blue milk. Just don't cut me off right now. We're the plot holly. Apart for you. for you, Shane and Brian are an island. Two real life misfit toys, wanting to be a RoboCop. Thank you for your cooperation. Settling for Black Circle Boys, and just like Dr. Hammond. Extracting amber from wood. And later there's running and then screaming. A little too busy asking if we could. And never asking if we should. But every movie has a plot hole. And every hole gets filled somehow. With whiskey, wine, or blue milk. Just don't. Right now, we're the Plotaholics, a breakfast club of two. We're the Plotaholics, ripping plots apart for you. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man.